Words are really important, right? I don't know how many of you can think back to a moment when somebody said something to you that stuck with you forever and really changed you. I think about how important words are. I can think of a number of those occasions. I can think of one time when I was about in sixth grade. I had um, about maybe six months before we'd remodeled part of our house. And I was sort of a curious child, so I would always go watch any repairman that came into our house, I would watch and see what they did or anybody was doing anything. And I watched these guys uh, paint and do stuff. And so that it, summertime hit, and I decided I was going to paint my own bathroom. And I got a sign off from mom. Dad didn't know anything about this. but So I got painter's drop cloths and the painter's tape and did all the stuff. And I'm busy painting when my dad came in. And my dad opened up the door and was like, whoa. Uh, <laughs> And he said to me, I mean, he was just off the cuff, but he said, I'm convinced that if you put your mind to anything, you can do it. And he, I'm sure he doesn't remember that moment, but I remember it forever because it notched my level of confidence up about four, four notches on that one moment. And it made a difference. And they can make it, all the, many of us have got those kinds of stories of one moment where somebody maybe off the cuff said something that just sticks with you for the good. Of course, there's also things that can be for the bad, right? Words can be potent the other direction. Even if they're innocent, even if they're misunderstood, sometimes they just, they just stick there, right? I, when I think about this, I always think about um, when my boys, uh, my twin boys were five years old, we had a part-time nanny. And she was wonderful. Love her. I, st I still recommend her to, to people. I just did that recently. But she's fantastic. But English was not her mother tongue. And uh, that made for a problem when the boys got to be about five. I mean, she loved the boys. That's what made her so good. She loved the boys. But she, we came home one day from work, and she said to us, uh, I'm really good at taking care of and loving on little children, but when they get to a certain maturity level, it's kind of time for me to go on. And your children have reached that. And they're like five. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what's happened here? Like, what's going on here? So and I was like, oh, you know, we're okay. Well, you've been great. We love you, you know. And, and so then I'm investigating with the boys. And it took me a little while to piece it together. But here's what happened. They were out in the backyard playing. And the boys, she had sort of intimated that they had said something offensive to her and all this. And so I was trying to figure out how these five-year-olds had done that. I explored the situation. They were in the backyard playing. And they said something to her about making, doing something with a booby trap. <laughs> yeah, they said something offensive. She thought it went... <laughs> anyway, the, the power of words. That, we couldn't talk her out of it. It was kind of too embarrassing to say, yeah, no, they were talking about something else. They weren't talking about your chest, you know. <laughs> anyway, words are powerful. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the power of words and how we love. And we're doing this as part of a sermon series where we, we've been looking at basically how much God loves us, and then talking about what that means as we love the people in our lives. That's a series that we've been doing. We've got a couple more weeks to go after today where that's what we're looking at. And um, if you haven't been with us to, to um, latch on to what Eric said a few moments ago, all the sermons we've done are online. You can go look them up. We did the first one talking about um, a passage from Corinthians. We're talking about how our main principle, chief aim in life is to love related to how God loves and God is love and all of this. And then last week, we talked about holding up a model, an example of Jesus as the best one to look at and looking at how he loved us and then talking about how he commands us to love as he loved and trying to talk that, take that into our various relationships. And today, we're talking about how we love with words. And, um, you know, we, we think about that. It's really important. There are many, many passages that talk about what we do with our words in Scripture. And I'm going to mention only a few today because of our time constraints. But let me start by just getting you to think about how powerful words are with um, a passage that we read from the book of James in James 3. And Jay, if you'll follow this with me. It says, If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large, it takes strong winds to drive them. Yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, 
The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed, and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not be so. Does the spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? This idea that this tongue is so powerful in its ability to bless and its ability to curse. And, you know, you get this idea that this, this little thing on a ship makes the whole ship turn. And I don't know about you, but many of us have had this experience, I'm sure lots of us in the room have had it, where you have said this one thing, and you sort of know the rudder just shifted and you didn't mean for that to happen. And the whole ship is starting to turn in a way you didn't necessarily want. Now part of what we want to do today is talk about how can we make those moments where that rudder shifts in a great way. And you see the whole thing shift and you're like, yes. Or how many of us have said something and watched that small fire start to burn up half of California? You know, this idea that that's the power. And when we think about it, we said this a couple weeks ago. But when we start to think about what we say with our mouths, it's like a, um, a tube of toothpaste, that what's on the inside comes out. And there are lots of ways that we see this happen. I'm not going to read it in the interest of time, but Jesus, one of his passages, um, he's actually going off after somebody on the negative side, but he's basically saying, how can good come out of you because all the bad stuff you've got going on? And this idea that if we have good going on, that's what's going to come out of us. That we keep doing. So to me, it's always a reminder of the call for us to cultivate our interior life, to continue to cultivate God's presence in our own lives. And, and we think, well, how do we do that? Well, that's kind of what the two sermons we've done already are about, is in part receiving constantly and more of all the time God's love into us, because that, that that's what will come out in ways we, we could not do, and practicing it. We, I mean, we've got to practice exercising grace, practice exercising all this stuff. And we want to talk about practicing it today with our words. And that's where I want to turn to now, sort of how do we do that? And even before we um, do that, is begin to ask the question, to whom are we doing this? Like, like we're, we're talking about how we love people with words. Who are we loving? And I want to suggest to you that um, if you read scripture on this, we're we're meant to do this with everyone, right down to in our own way or even our enemies, but everyone, right? Everyone, every single person we're meant to love with our words. Let God's goodness come out of us to bless people, not curse them, to bless them. I was thinking about this this week. I, I, this past week, I met with a friend, um, and I'll keep this all anonymous, but um, this person was telling me their experience was, was super encouraging to me about how they'd gone super low unemployed for like two years and, and th what they learned in their time in the desert. And my comment to the person is, you know, we learn so much in the desert, but I don't want to go there. Nobody does. But we do learn a lot when we're in the desert. And this person did. And this person was telling me how close they were to being homeless. And they were telling me that whenever now, whenever they see a homeless person and they're walking downtown or whatever, they're still not in a place now where they have a lot of money. But that what they, he, this guy does is he walks up to the person and says, I, I apologize, I, I've been close to where you are. There's nothing I can do for you right now in terms of money. But here's what I'd love to do. I'd love to give you a hug. And he says that without fail, every single one of them has stood up, received the hug, and thanked him with sincerity. No one has touched me. Nobody has hugged me like that. And just this blessing that he's in the moment. And he's blessing that person with his words and with his actions. It's meant to be for everyone. And we can go down the list of all our different um, relationships that we have. For sure, for those of you who have partners, it's meant to bless your partner. And if, if you guys have never read um, Chapman's book on the five love languages, and if your spouse's main love language is words, like you need to triple down on this sermon, right? You need to be practicing words every day because that's how they understand love. It's a fantastic book. Or our children our friends, all these different things, right? 
But what I, so what I want to do um, with the rest of the sermon, I mean, there are way, way, way more passages about how to bless people with our words in Scripture than I can speak about. I want to pick just a few words. I want to mainly look at a passage from Ephesians, and I want to look at a number of the of Proverbs, these words of wisdom from the book of Proverbs that speak to us on these things. And, and the beginning place is I just want to um, go to a passage from Ephesians. This is from Ephesians 4.25. St. Paul's writing to them, and he says, So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one body. Let us speak truth. And just a couple passages before that, in Ephesians 4.15, he says, But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way. And he goes on to say the reason we're doing this is because we want to be built up in love itself. This idea that we want to speak the truth in love. And, you know, part of that is to begin to think about what does that mean, right? What, is, what do we mean by that? Well, I could start out by saying, if, you, if any of you have ever read the book by Dale Carnegie, or know who Dale Carnegie is now at this point, but he, read that, he wrote this book. He was a great motivational um, speaker, talker. I think they still teach his courses, maybe. But he wrote a book on how to win friends and influence people. And part of the gist of this book was don't criticize or complain or condemn. So basically it was every time you encounter somebody, only give them stuff that makes them feel good all the time. And I think what Jesus is, I mean, what we're getting in Paul's part of this and what Jesus models for us is when you love somebody, there is a way that we're called to speak truth to them if you love them, right? And, and I'm going to suggest... It's far from the Dale Carnegie thing. It can be rough at times, right? I mean, Jesus, for his part, we look at him as the best example ever. He's pretty rough on some people. I mean, like loving, but rough, right? So if you're on the, the outside, he has no problems walking up to certain people and say, calling them hypocrites or calling another group faithless and stuck in their ways. And, and you're thinking, well, of course, they're on the outside. They're the people that are out there somewhere. But what about the people that are on the inside? The people Jesus, like they know Jesus loves them. Like he's in their circle. Like I think about Peter, when Peter is telling, is telling him, no, no, Jesus, you can't do that. You, he's talking about what's going to happen. You, you can't do this or whatever else. And, and he looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. How many times has a friend in love told, said, get behind me, Satan, to, to you, right? I mean, he can be pretty straight on. But the part about it that we can't miss is that this passage is talking about speaking truth and love together. Those two have to go together. That, in fact, that's the only way it can be received, I think. If you know somebody really loves you, they're in your camp, they're in your corner, they can say something to you that you need to hear that otherwise you'd be like, oh, who's wrong with that guy? I think about this. I'm the only person in my family that drinks coffee, and so I don't really make it at the house. I stop at a coffee shop. And for, I used to sit at the table doing my quiet time and doing stuff at the coffee shop. And a number of years ago, I started sitting at the community table, which has been a blessing, right? So I've gotten to know all these different folks that sit at the community table. And recently, one of these guys who's about my age, um, his girlfriend of about two years broke up with him. And he is not handling it well, I'm just going to say. But I've been so encouraged to watch his friends at that table who love him trying to tell him, like, you're not seeing this straight. You're not getting this. They're actually speaking the truth in love. And he's over there. No, he knows they love him, and he's still really struggling to take on what they're saying. Like, he's still, I won't go into the details, but, but it's beautiful for me to watch because they really are speaking the truth in love. And that, that's what we're about, right? And I think about parents, right? This is the challenge. When I think about parent being a parent, this is really sometimes where things get rough because... I think every parent, if they're honest, will say, I really want my children to be my friends. I, I have this dream of being lifelong friends with my children. But you, sometimes you've got to come back to this place, but wait a minute, I'm a parent first. Particularly w when they're young, right? And you're thinking, I've got to speak truth and love to them. I, I'm not able to just please them. There are moments where I have to step up and be a parent. I've got to say something that's truthful, that's hard. Because my job is to love them and help them grow in character and flourish in life. And that's something, at times, they don't want to hear. But that's part of loving. That's truth and love. That's the way it is. And I think about 
when we think about doing that, so much of it is about the motivation, right? We're, later on in this series, we've got two more sermons after today. We're going to go to the great love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. But part of 1 Corinthians 13 in verse 6 talks about how love doesn't seek, um, it doesn't seek the wrong, something for the wrong reasons, but it seeks truth. That it's, it's this idea that um, it's all about our motivation on that, right? It doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, to quote it directly. It doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices in truth. So it's about the motivation. It's, it's trying to rejoice in doing the right thing. And so I think when we talk about speaking the, the truth in love, it's about the right place, the right timing, and all this. Let me give you guys a really practical example of this. If you walk away saying, oh, that was a horrible sermon. At the door is not the time to tell me. <laughs> Wait at least until Monday. You can say today, good effort. And then tomorrow you can email me or call me and say, yeah, I don't, that didn't, you didn't connect with everybody. You, blah, blah, whatever it is, you know, you know how it is. So this idea that it's you know, the time and the place and the love and what's behind it. And I think along with it is to pack it full of humility because we don't always get stuff right. I love this uh, quote from Will Rogers that I read. Um, along the way where he talks about being gentle with your words because you don't know where they're going to eventually go. This is his, uh, sort of a poem, but he says, Be careful of the words you say. Keep them soft and sweet. You never know from day to day which ones you'll have to eat. <laughs> this idea that our, pack it with a little humility because we don't know. But I think, so to end this part of it, we want to speak the truth in love. And um, Proverbs 24, 26 says that honest words are like a kiss on the lips. I, I assume the unwritten part is from somebody you want to kiss you on the lips. But it's, it, it's a blessing. It's a blessing when somebody knows that it's said in love and it's, and it's honest. Well, there are two other things I want to say at a practical level. One is really short. And that is that we're, we're meant to say words, I think, that are gentle. And the word gentle itself means power under control. And, um, you know, like... It makes a difference, right? I think about Proverbs 15.1 talks about this. It says, A gentle answer turns away wrath or anger, but a harsh word stern, stirs up anger. I think that's true, right? <laughs> Trying to come at somebody not swinging, right? I'm not going to name any names. I'm going to let the people stay anonymous, but I have certain teenagers in my life who amaze me at the teenage mind how quickly it wants to swing because I'll say something to these teenagers they could be anybody right <laughs> did you put your phone in the right place where it was supposed to be last night nope. just like that very calm and it could be what do you mean I got <laughs> back you know it's like say a gentle word respond with a gentle word can go a really long ways right just in how we say things and we always want to notch things up you know um, I can speak for some of the lawyers in the room, you know, it's like you bring, a, suddenly you start lawyering up, things can go the other way. I, a lot of times when I talk to, some of y'all know my day job is, is a, um, a patent lawyer, but, and a trademark lawyer, but sometimes I'll talk to, to the client, I'll say, look, don't, let me, don't ask me to call their lawyer, why don't you call their executive? The executive calls the executive, goes a lot further than the lawyer calling the lawyer, because people are geared up, they're ready to fight, they're ready, you know, forget the incentive systems on top of that, but... But this idea of just being able to speak a gentle word where you say, let's try to resolve this. Let's work this out. Can save you a lot of money, and it can save you a lot of heartache in life. I think that's a word we get from Scripture and from a lot of places. The final thing I want to say, I think, is probably the most important one. And it comes from the same passage of Ephesians that I was reading a few minutes ago. Ephesians 4.29, which says, Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up. Only what is useful for building up. As there is need so that you may give grace to those who hear it. You build up so that you can give grace. And I think there are all kinds of ways that we can begin to talk about how we do that. But I think the biggest thing, I don't think it's that hard to figure out how you're going to bless people with your words. I think the hard part is for us to keep it in our windshield, to keep it out front. And you know, I know one guy who, um, who made it his ritual that every time he pulled in his driveway after a long day, he had this moment where he would stop before he took his hands off the wheel. He would remind himself, I'm starting the most important part of my day. And I'm going to go into my house and I'm going, to bless, I'm going to work to bless everyone that's in there. And I think, so I don't think it's magic 
about knowing what words to say or what gentleness to have, whatever else. It's, it's bringing it front and center again and saying, before I walk in the door, I want to remember I'm trying to bless and love with my words the people that are there. And there, there are lots of ways I think that that matters. And again, Proverbs is full of so many good wor- words about this. Proverbs 12, 25 says, Anxiety weighs down the human heart, but a good word cheers it up. And I oftentimes think about a, a priest friend of mine that I used to work, at, work with. It, it, he had great words, but his blessing, I'm going to count with words, was he could laugh at the greatest times. Like he had this great laugh. And we would have this moment where something had gone really wrong. Steve, you know what I'm talking about. Um, we'd have something that really went wrong, and he would just start by the, with his laugh. And it was just, his laugh is a blessing. And I think about that sometimes, you know, about, I, I'm not really good at that, but it's a blessing, and I wish I could be good at that. But we can say it with words, right? And that's our challenge, is just begin to think about how we do it. I'm terrible at this, because I think everybody knows I love them. I think everybody already knows that I think good things of them and all this, and I don't say it. And um, I see a counselor from time to time, and she'll always say to me, more words. You need to say more words. Because I take it for granted. You know, I'm sort of like, for the accountants in the room, I'm like the anomaly guy. Like, assume everything's good. Let's talk about the things that are wrong kind of thing. But people don't know that, right? We, we, we want acceptance. We avoid rejection. And it helps us if we stop and say, you know, I love you folks. You know, you're, you're good. You know, you're, this is what you're great at and all this kind of stuff. And um, I'm going to give you all some homework in a minute as we wind this thing up. But, but, it's, um, but it's powerful. And I'll tell you firsthand that about eight years ago, nine years ago, I went through a moment of ministry where I was burning out. And a few of my friends knew this. And they threw this party for me. It was just like, they didn't call it this, but I'm dubbing it like an encouragement party. And part of, the, part of the gear up for this party was they had everybody going to write me a note of encouragement. And to this day, I have this box of notes. And now I've started putting everybody's notes in it. And if I ever have a bad day or I'm starting to burn out or something's going on, I go read this. And I'm, I, I'm reminded of the stuff that, that's going on with this. And that's the power of it, you know. Everybody should do that. Have your box of, of these good words or this memory of good words that you can hold on to. So your homework if you're willing to accept it, is to pick somebody this week that you're going to bless with your words. Think of somebody that you want to encourage, somebody in your life. And if you're in this room and you're the person receiving that, don't answer by saying, oh, you're doing Father Bob's homework. (laughs) Just receive it and say, I'm glad you're giving, I'm glad you're giving voice to that. (laughs) Whatever. I mean, take that blessing. And, and, you know, maybe an example is this. If, If you're a family in your family and you, um, you love your family and you've never said it, find the courage to that, this week to say, I love you. I think about this sometimes with, my, I say this to my dad, you know, it was hard the first time, but I, I remember my dad um, back in the late 80s or 90s, I can't remember when the song was out, Mike and the Mechanics sang a song that was called In the Living Years. And part of the song was he's singing about how he wished he had told his dad certain things during his dad's life. And he regrets it, and he talks about seeing his dad and his child, different things. And my dad listened to the song. He doesn't listen to pop music ever, but he listened to the song, and it moved him so much. And I could just see in his mind thinking, I wish I had done that with my dad while he was alive. And so, like, why don't do that? You love these people. Why have you never done that? Why not step out, if it's awkward or whatever, just this week and just say, I love you. See what happens. And, you know, the thing about it is, I think we get blessed back, Right? All right, so um, there are lots of ways that we love people, and we're going to continue to talk about this. One of those ways is words. We love people by speaking the truth in love. We love by speaking gentle words. We love surely by trying to build up and to encourage. And I'm going to um, end with a quick story. I think I have time, Eric, wherever you are. Maybe? No, he's shaking his head. (laughs) Can I be quick? Can we cut some of the the announcements or something? (laughs) something you can read them i was thinking about how not only do words bless that to us today but, that, but they echo right and i just read a story this week that just stuck with me um this is from a book by philip yancey on prayer and um he writes this and bear with me this is about four about three or four paragraphs we'll be okay <laughs> philip yancey says during our trip to nepal 
A physical therapist gave my wife and me a tour of Green Pastures Hospital, which specializes in leprosy rehabilitation. As we walk, walked along the outdoor corridor, I noticed in a courtyard one of the ugliest human beings I've ever seen. Her hands were bandaged in gauze. She had deformed stumps where most people have feet, and her face showed the worst ravages of that cruel disease. Her nose had shrunk in a way so that looking at her, I could see into her sinus cavity. Her eyes, molted and covered with callus, let in no light. She was totally blind. Scars covered patches of skin on her arms. We toured a unit of the hospital and returned along the same corridor. In the meantime, this creature had crawled across the courtyard to the very edge of the walkway, pulling herself along the ground by planting her elbows and dragging her body like a wounded animal. I'm ashamed to say my first thought was she's a beggar and she wants money. My wife, who has worked among the down and out, had a much more holy reaction. Without hesitation, she bent down to the woman and said words of love and put her arm around her. The old woman rested her head on Janet's shoulder and began singing a song in Nepali, a tune that we all instantly recognized. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Dahan Maya is one of our most devoted church members, the physical therapist later told us. Most of our patients are Hindus, but we have a little Christian chapel here, and Dana Maya comes every time the doors open. She's a prayer warrior. She loves to greet and welcome every visitor who comes to Green Pastures, and no doubt she heard us talking as we walked along the corridor. A few months later, we heard Donna Maya had died. Close to my desk, I keep a photo that I snapped just as she was singing to Janet. Whenever I feel polluted by the beauty-obsessed celebrity culture I live in, a culture in which people pay exorbitant sums to shorten their noses or plump up their breasts to achieve some impossible ideal of beauty, while 9,000 people die each day from AIDS for a lack of treatment in hospitals like green pastures scrape on charity crumbs, I pull out that photo. I see two beautiful women, my wife smiling sweetly, wearing a brightly colored Nepali outfit she had bought the day before, holding in her arms an old crone who, flunk in, who would flunk any beauty test ever devised except the one that matters most. Out of that deformed, hollowed shell of a body, the light of God's presence shines out. What we say matters, and it echoes. Let us pray.